I want to welcome everybody to uh, the National Links Trust's fourth uh, webinar on, on municipal golf. Um, our, our first uh, three sort of covered more urban golf courses, and, and now we're, we're moving out to a smaller town, more rural, um, but really what I think is an inspiring story that I hopefully other communities can learn from and, uh, and implement um, in, in, in some ways uh, in, their, in their own home communities. So um, I want to uh, welcome our, uh, our panelists um, from uh, Garden City, uh, Kansas, Kansas, and um, Buffalo Dunes uh, Golf Course. Um, uh, we'll start with, with Clay Payne, who's the superintendent at Buffalo Dunes. Uh, Clay, Clay is uh, the golf course superintendent. Uh, he has been in that role since 2017. He was born and raised in Garden City and grew up playing golf on Buffalo Dunes. Um, prior to his current role, Clay, uh, Clay worked as an assistant superintendent uh, for five years at Nebraska's Dismal River and for two years at Valley Neal Golf Club in Holyoke, Colorado. Um, thank, thank you, Clay, for joining us. Uh, next up is Zach Vardy, uh, golf course architect. Zach grew up uh, as the son of a golf course superintendent in Minnesota. He started working in golf course maintenance in high school and transitioned to golf course design and construction after college. Uh, Zach started his career as a shaper for Core and Crenshaw, and his project portfolio includes Bandon Preserve, Sand Valley, Ozarks National, Br and, and Brambles. Um, the Buffalo Dunes project is Zach's first working under his own design firm, Vardy Golf Design. Um, thanks, Zach. Uh, Matt Allen, uh, Garden City's city manager. Uh, Matt Allen has been the city manager of Garden City, Kansas since June of 2008. Prior to that, Matt was Garden City's assistant city manager for six years. He leads a municipal, golf, uh, municipal government team that is receiving regional and national attention for innovation in the areas of public participation and transparency, transportation, embracing recreation, uh, excuse me, embracing diversity and healthy community design for rural communities. Uh, Matt was also raised in Garden City um, and uh, worked in local government um, throughout uh, the Midwest uh, in places like Lenexa, Kansas, Salina, Kansas, and Joplin, Missouri. Uh, Matt served on the Kansas Health Foundation's board of directors for nine years and came, occasionally works as a public administration consultant and is currently the co-chair of the Economic Lifelines at Kansas Transportation Advocacy Group. Lastly, uh, Jennifer Cumming, Cunningham, who is Garden City's city attorney. Uh, Jennifer is the, the uh, city attorney for, for Garden City, Kansas, a role she's had since the beginning of 2022. Jennifer began working for Garden City in 2012 as the city prosecutor and then as the deputy chief manager in 2015. Uh, during her six years as deputy chief, uh, deputy city manager, she oversaw the municipal court, uh, the Buffalo Dunes Golf Course, Garden oh. City Regional Airport, the Lee Richardson Zoo, and the city's uh, police and fire department. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Clay, Zach, Matt, and Jennifer for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Um, Jennifer, I, I might start with you. Um, what's, what's life like in, in, in Garden City? Well, it's awesome. Um, living in Garden City is really good. Um, it's changed a lot since uh, I first moved out here in um, 2010 is actually when I first came to Garden City. Um, and there's been a ton of development um, and the city of Garden City itself, the, the local government um, has added a ton of young professionals who um, are kind of on the cutting edge of uh, trying to do new things, kind of trying to invent themselves and figure out where they fit into the pieces. Um, and it's a great place to live and work because uh, it does really well. The economy is great and has has been great the entire time I've been here um, and continues to grow. And also the community is super supportive. Um, and yet it feels like you live in a little tiny town because you know everybody and you can get anywhere in a couple minutes. Um, and so I think it has so many positive things. Uh, it has so many positive things going for it. That's great. And Matt, it, it, um, it's, a, it's a town of about 25,000, if I have that correctly. And it, the, main, the main industry would be agri agricultural? 
Yeah, sure. Ag industry really is kind of the driver. Uh, the population is probably around 30 to 31,000 for the city and uh, you know, maybe 45 to 47,000 for Finney County. That's great. And, um, you know, obviously no one on this call was around when, when the city leaders decided to uh, build Buffalo Dunes 50 years ago. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about the role that, that Buffalo Dunes has played in the community over the years. Sure, I'd be glad to. The uh, uh, the course was uh, built in or, or opened in uh, 1976, I believe. Uh, Clay can correct me if, if that's off, but um, the uh, it was a gift. Um, the land was gifted by uh, a large uh, feed yard operator, Earl Brookover, and uh, interestingly enough, nearby. His plan was to open a country club as well, uh, with a with a golf course, and uh, and so we wanted there to be a municipal golf course as well, and and uh, uh, w one that was of high caliber. So uh, th that land was gifted. The uh, the course was created. Uh, the, the course over the years has been blessed with really good course superintendents, really good golf pros, uh, and it's a department of the city. It's it it. Uh, um, it's we call it one of our crown jewels, along with a, a municipal airport that has regional jet service and a and a, one of 220 accredited zoos in the country. Uh, so that, you know it's 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 a highly valued attraction by the community, and uh, I I guess I would just underscore what Jennifer mentioned. You know we've just got a really talented team of folks that uh, have a license to experiment. And uh, uh, and take some chances and and look to improve upon what others have built. So um, Clay's certainly done that with this project in partnership with Zach. Clay, uh, you grew up playing playing there. Um, what were your thoughts of of the golf course there when you were growing up, and how did that change as you uh, traveled around and and uh, were working at places like Dismal River and, and Valley Neal? Sure. So uh, playing might be an exaggeration. <laughs> I won't tell you what my scores were, but we definitely made our our way around the course. Uh, starting at a young age, it, it was always my favorite favorite place to go. It's it's quite unique to this region. Uh, we're nestled in sand dunes, which isn't isn't typical of this um, area. And I think that that um, without knowing it was is kind of why it was my favorite course growing up. As I traveled around um, to Nebraska or Colorado or seeing some of the other great clubs in the Midwest, they're almost all set in sand dunes and just being able to draw that back to my favorite uh, course growing up was a pretty easy comparison. Um, so it sounds like the Buffalo Dunes has been a, a really valued asset of the community in Garden City for for you know close to fifty years now, um, what was the impetus uh, to take a look at the golf course and, and make changes? Um, sure, as uh, Matt said, this this organization um, will allow you to grow and and try new ideas. And um, starting in twenty seventeen. You know, we started to compile a list of small improvements that we thought uh, could have a larger impact. Uh, most importantly, uh, water conservation, as we are trending to a drier and drier climate, we identified areas that were out of play um, that we were constantly maintaining, whether that be with irrigation or equipment. So that kind of started the ball um, rolling as far as the plan goes. Um, and one thing led to another. We, our maintenance staff compiled all these small improvements and then we presented them to Jennifer um, and said, hey, how do, how do we accomplish this? Um, you know, being through a municipal uh, system, there's often, uh, you need to have approved plans and, and whatnot. So that's really what, what started the master plan. Um, and when I say master plan, it's more of a vision. You know, there's a lot of, stuff that were maybe in that initial plan that as Zach gets his feet on the ground that you kind of let the artist work. Um, so there, that that's where it kind of started. Uh, we're in year three now of a six-year program 
we kind of designed it. Six, um, six years was manageable for our small staff. We wanted to make sure that we were able to accomplish a lot of these things in-house. Um, and it also coincided with our 50th anniversary, which will be in 2026. Um, Je Jennifer, uh, water resources and use of water is uh, one of the main uh, challenges that the city of Garden City is, is facing. Do I have that right? Yeah, of course. Um, Matt can probably speak to that a little bit better than I can since that's an in-house department of the city of Garden City. Um, but Buffalo Dunes had a special system installed before I ever took over, um, before that became one of my departments. That was something that had happened prior to that um, that allowed them to do things like since when there had been rain, um, control them from home, control them remotely so that they wouldn't overuse um, and that there was a lot of money invested in that um, a couple of years before um, I was involved with the golf course. And part of that was with the idea in mind, um, one, because they wanted the course to be beautiful and, and, and look nice, but also so that there wasn't an overuse of water to do that. Um, and I think there had been some issues with that in the past. And Matt, I know this is uh, something that the city, not just on the golf course, is addressing in a, in a holistic way. Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, uh, about that sure uh you know in in southwest kansas uh it's a semi-arid desert climate um that's high plains uh geography uh north of the city and um south of the city would be uh would be sand hills so th this course is located in the sand hills as is the city's domestic groundwater supply um in the general proximity of the course, we have all of our domestic water wells, and those are, uh, um, you know, feeding into a, a system that takes it a few miles north into the city into a reservoir where uh, the water is held and then let out into the municipal water distribution system. Uh, so, water in the sand hills and water in the Ogallala Aquifer uh, is our lifeblood. I mean, if it isn't, uh, if there's not water here, there's not people here. Um, so. We know that uh, it is maybe the most important thing we address as a community is uh, taking a lead on uh, water conservation um, and uh, and having that apply to every aspect of what it is we do. And that's a tough ask of a golf course located in the sand hills to say, hey, we still want this to be a first class uh, nationally and regionally recognized facility, but oh, by the way, we need you to, uh, uh, be more conservative with your water use. So, uh, you know, Clay can tell you where it's ended up or the trajectory uh, uh, that it appears it'll end up. But, you know, this course used 150 million gallons pretty consistently. Uh, and the uh, and the wells dedicated to this, the groundwater wells dedicated to this, this course, um, it, it, it brushed up against 100% of its allocation every year and for those listeners on uh, on the webinar that are familiar with groundwater and groundwater appropriation uh you know that's it you hit that mark and that's all the water you get and so mother nature doesn't provide near enough out here to operate a golf course so it has to be uh supplemented significantly with groundwater supplies so uh you know clay's really taken that that charge to heart and it, it is you know from I would say by any standard, whether it's the city departments or any other user in Garden City or Finney County, uh, Clay and his staff have, have really led this uh, course improvement, which is outstanding just from a course improvement standpoint, but it's really become a model for water conservation as well. Well, Clay, maybe this is a good time to bring, to bring Zach in. Um, you guys met while uh, you were working at Dismal River, and Zach was, uh, I think, an intern for Tom Doak and working on the crew there. And it sounds like he spent a good deal of time out there. So, um, you know, you you arrive in Garden City at Buffalo Dunes in 2017, back home. Um, I see this need to to um, address the the drought uh, issues and water issues. And um, when did when did Zach get involved? And he talk a little bit about. Uh, his his role and what's been going on. 
Sure. So 2017 was when we just kind of, kind of started compiling these ideas um, to develop the master plan. Um, we set out um, in 2018 in search of a firm to help us construct the, uh, the really put our ideas into one, develop this master plan, and then not only develop it, but execute it. So we went through a process of that, that selection committee. Uh, Zach obviously stands out from his resume, if you look as far as operators on Sandy sites. Um, he's worked with the best on the best and just seemed like a natural fit uh, for this club, um, regardless of uh, maybe past experiences with him. And then uh, tying it back into the water conservation, we have been to clubs such as Valley Neal or the Sand Valleys and stuff like that. And we've seen what uh, like a walking only community and, and how that ties into water conservation. Uh, so managing a course that's walking only is just, uh, it's, it's exponentially less water and inputs to maintain a golf course at the highest quality. So we had that background going in um, and then, then it was just a matter of collecting our ideas and um, making Buffalo Dunes the best experience. We know that we're going to have golf carts. You know, we're not going to be able to push things the way that we might in other clubs. But how do we, how do we produce those same, you know, firm conditions on a daily basis? Um, use as little inputs, but still maintain that golfing experience. And Zach has uh, let him him add to that, but that that's kind of the background of of how this plan has been put into place. Yeah, Zach, what what were your first impressions when you when you first saw Buffalo Dunes? Yeah, so uh, you know my first memories of Buffalo Dunes were talking with Clay at Dismal River. You know, and he said, "Hey, I grew up in in Southwest Kansas," and immediately when I think of Kansas golf, I think of Prairie Dunes. You know, and he said, well, there's this course, Buffalo Dunes, and, and it's also on sand dunes. It's right right next to where I grew up. So it was always in the back of my mind. And when he got hired as superintendent in 2017, he invited me out there. And so I first saw the course in the summer of 2017, uh, you know, driving out there. It is pretty remote. Once you get past Prairie Dunes, it's, you know, two and a half hours and a lot of it's flat agriculture land. And sure enough, I, I pulled into garden and turned south and here's all these sand dunes, you know, and they're just stretching for miles. There's four to five miles of sand dunes south of Garden City and you could build a number of really, really good golf courses there. So immediately my interest was peaked and I thought, well, hey, there there might be something here at Buffalo Dunes, you know, and pulling into the parking lot and, and going around with clay the first time around the course, you could see its potential immediately. You could see the soils were really good. You could see the topography was really good. You know, a lot of the topography was was hidden a little bit by some of the tree planting that had occurred, but essentially the course was the same as it had been designed in, in 1976. Uh, you know, most of the green sites and tea sites were very good. The routing was very good for walking, which is a plus for me. There were lots and lots of positives right off the bat. So I was immediately excited. Yeah, and so uh, it sounds like over the next few years, or it sounds like there was a selection process, and you were, you were, you were chosen to be the consulting architect, um, and you developed a master plan in in what 2019 was it early 2020? With yeah, so you know, like I said, I first saw it in 2017. Starting in 2018, the the city went through their selection and interview process, um, and you know, I was selected as a consulting architect along with Todd Clark. Todd Clark is based out of Kansas City. And so Todd and I have been working together. You know, it's, it's been a very good partnership. You know, I can do the design shape type of stuff that I did with Tom Doak and that I do with Corin Crenshaw. And Todd, you know, has been through the municipal golf process before. He's worked with a lot of different municipalities. He's local from Kansas. He has a lot of the stuff that the city was looking for. And he sort of acts, you know, as an advisor and then frees me up to do all the cool shaping that I do with, with core Crenshaw. So it's been a, a really smooth process. Um, yeah, we were selected early in 2019 and went out there 
you know, my ideas and Todd's coincided. We agree on, you know, 95% of stuff. Clay's involved with all these processes as well. Between the three of us, there's a lot of agreement on, on the design process and we all have some input. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a very smooth process. Starting in 2020, we got that master plan finalized and then started construction that fall. And then, you know, 2020, 2021 and 2022, the last three years we've been, you know, renovating the golf course. It's been very exciting. So in today's uh, day and age, um, people like to have things immediately. Um, they want the change to happen overnight. Uh, it seems like uh, Buffalo Dunes and Garden City made a very concerted choice to not do that, to take their time over uh, implementing this master plan. Um, I'm not sure who the best person to speak to this is. Maybe it's Matt, maybe it's Clay. Can you talk a little bit about what the plan is in, in, in implementing this, this uh, master plan and um, why it was sort of important to, to do it over, say, six years, six phases? Um, I think Clay is probably the best one. Yeah, go ahead, Clay. I'll start out. Um, so as we looked at this, um, one of our, we, we would like to obviously budgetary keep this as as low as we can, um, A, because that's just how you should do a project. We, we're not going to jeopardize quality, but um, there's no sense in spending dollars if they're unnecessary. And so we looked at uh, six years. We thought that that was a manageable um, timeline. A lot of that came down to six years allows our small staff to be able to accomplish these goals um, while also maintaining the golf course. So I currently have two assistants, Mitch Chalkley and Brock Walter. Um, Ross Miller just recently retired, but we are looking at doing this project while maintaining the club and playability um, with quite a small crew. Six years. Um, also, Zach um, can attest to this. It allows us to be very intimate with each detail. Um, we're not trying to get a project done just to say we've got a project done. Um, this is, again, I mentioned it earlier, this is kind of uh, Zach out there with a paintbrush and artwork, and uh, there's no need to rush. Uh, our end game is very long term. And so, yeah, what I've really appreciated a I get to uh, I get to do this with uh, some of my best friends, which they may not appreciate it with the long hours that we sometimes put in. But it's been a really fun process to do that um, alongside them. But also, yeah, just just not miss details and uh, just go about the process and and make sure that um, it's the best that it can be in six years, which on paper may seem extended, but long term is not necessarily that big a deal. Um, so as you, you mentioned, a major constraint being being money, um, I guess maybe Matt or Jennifer, you could talk a little bit about how a, a municipality budgets um, for something like this. And um, what what do you guys, when you guys were considering this, what, what did you look at as the the positives uh, uh, the negatives the the cost benefit analysis of how how this made sense and I, I understand and we'll get we'll get into the numbers here in a little bit that um you know when clay says that they're doing this economically you guys really are doing it economically but can you just talk a little bit about the decision making process and and how uh, how that went down well jennifer if you want to take this since you were uh, uh um when this project started you were kind of responsible for uh for, uh, for their budget along with uh, clay and jason so when this project first started um you know kind of how the city works um is that department heads really manage their own budget um they figure out uh what they need for the year um when it comes to necessities and then you know the potential wants that they may have and how that may fit into the constraints of what they're what they're able to have um and then when they have bigger asks they have they sort of have a um bucket that they can pick from of options of how to go about asking for those things. So, you know, if it's something like staff, that's going to go into the budget process for um, 
the city commission um, that's done annually, uh, projects typically go through a capital improvement process where the community kind of weighs in to see whether or not it's something that um, they see as a priority. Um, but those are big ticket items. Those are things that are fairly expensive or they're gonna cost um, the city a large amount of money. And had Clay not been innovative in how he was gonna go about doing this, that's exactly where this would have landed. This would have landed in the capital improvement uh, process. And then it would have been up to the community to decide whether to do this versus other things that are really important also like street projects and other things that have to get done. And so sometimes these really fun and exciting things don't get done even though they're important because they're outweighed by only having so many dollars that can be spent in a pot over a group of capital improvement projects. So when Clay came in, he knew that. He was very well aware. We had been through a couple of budget processes um, and he and I had talked. In fact, the golf course was trying to figure out ways to save money. They were trying to figure out ways to bring in more revenue, to create more golfers. Um, they were trying to figure out um, things to make themselves stand out, um, to be something different, uh, maybe to get additional people interested in Buffalo Dunes, maybe even non-golfers. Um, and so we, we have, were able to have a lot of conversations around that because um, although Matt plays golf, I am I, I don't and I, I never have, but love Buffalo Dunes um, because I think it has so much more to offer than just playing golf. Um, and so in that, uh, Clay, Clay was really adamant that this was something he wanted to do. Um, there was absolutely no telling him no. It wasn't something that he was going to take no for an answer if it was solely about money. Um, if the commission had said, no, this is a project we don't want to do, I think he would have he would have understood and he would have backed down from that. But when it was a question of, we can't do this because we don't have the funds. Um, it really became something that Clay was like, I'm going to figure out a way to do this. Um, it's going to be on the back of my staff. It's going to be on parks employees. Anybody who will stand up and help, um, I'm gonna take their help and I'm gonna work around the clock to try and make this happen. And so it became less of a budget discussion at that point because he was able to really explain to the commission how he was taking a multi-million dollar project and consolidating it into something that he could uh, annually over six years build into his budget and pay for. Um, and I think the commission saw saw the effort on his part and sort of met him halfway and said, yeah, let's let's do this. Let's invest in this. So um, Clay, uh, let's talk about the headline number. If, if you, this was this project was done um, and it was outsourced to a, a golf course contractor. What, what do you think the, the total number would be? Uh, I wouldn't want to be nailed down to the number. Sure, but you can give it's a, more give a of, ballpark. Zach, Zach might be able to give you a better answer than that um, with, with the courses he's worked at. Uh, well, certainly this is a unique project and we're saving money in a number of different ways. Uh, you know, I think the soil is the big advantage. You know, we're on sand. We don't need to put bunker drainage in. We don't need to put green drainage in. We, you know, we don't need to do USGA greens. Um, you know, I think that this number, you know, if you're doing all 18 holes at other courses, you know, it's in the millions of dollars. It's a, it's a one, two, $3 million project. And here we're doing it for you know pennies on the dollar compared to that, and the soil is a huge advantage. Yeah, um, and Clay, you Jennifer re referenced you sort of not just using your staff, um, but other other uh, municipal employees, other uh, people in the community. You know, I I first learned about Buffalo Dunes through the Great Golf Magazine article that talked about sort of the volunteer nature of of the people that helped out on the golf course. Um, how did that come about and, and how does it work? Because it's not necessarily just sort of uh, random people from the community. It, it is very concentrated and con a concerted effort across uh, various uh, parts of the, of the city, city government. Sure. So um, as, as we looked at this um, and this project, um, initially, we, I'll go back to the, the water. We were looking, we identified 20 acres of bluegrass that we were able to convert or are going to be able to convert to native areas, um, we're not gonna be able to utilize all of that bluegrass in our current re renovation. So I started asking around to the zoo, parks and rec, cemetery, um, throughout, the, throughout the city, hey, that we might have these, these available. Uh, we'd love for you to come and help us lay a green. We have all the sod. Um, uh, it also is a testament to uh, this community, uh, we work a lot together. 
And we take a lot of pride in not only our own departments, but being a part of a, a bigger whole, which is the city of Garden City and um, being residents here. So if, if you need help in this area, um, you just have to ask. And there tends to be a lot of individuals that will show up. Um, and it, it kind of started as a golf course vision, golf course project. But as we've been able to work alongside now, I think that there's around a dozen different departments in the city that have helped lay sod on our greens. Like it is, is now no longer a Buffalo Dunes project. It's a city of Garden City project. It's it's become their vision. It's not our vision. And uh, it's fun to be a part of. It's great. It's great. Um does that require coordination with the city or is it you reaching out to other departments or uh, what, what what was the process to kind of get them bought in? Sure. So a lot of we're, we talk, we have a lot of department heads where we're interacting with these other individuals um, on a for sure uh, monthly basis, if not weekly. Uh, so it's just a matter of um, communicating to them that this is this is something, this is a need that we can have. How can we help you in, in your projects as well? Uh, trying to break down those silos. Um, asking for help was probably my hardest thing initially, uh, but it's been such a blessing. Uh, it's opened up, you know, so many other avenues to where, you know, we're working on other projects with the, with the parks and developing um, low irrigation requirement parks. And how does this, you know, now you see, all this this interaction between departments of utilizing our own specialties uh, to make the overall experience at Garden City the best it can be for the the people that we serve. That's great. Um, you're you're two two or three years into the process now. Is that I have it right? Yep, year three. Uh, so we've accomplished a lot in those three years. So far, we've converted roughly five acres of bluegrass to non-irrigated native. Um, ne as a, after next year, we will have been able to remove 72 irrigation heads, which sounds like a small number, but that's water savings from here till the end of the golf course. Um, we project an annual savings of around 15 million gallons of water through this project, uh, 16 hours of labor savings. And um, that's on a weekly basis. Yeah, weekly basis, 16 hours per week. Um, and that's kind of the conservative estimation. We'll be able to utilize those hours to the detail stuff that we're currently missing. Um, 10 greens. So 10 greens and green complexes have been renovated um, with all new turf shaping. And the turf that we're utilizing uh, for those greens is grown on site. So each spring we'll plant a $1,500 worth of seed and that will generate over three greens worth of bent grass in the fall, uh, saving us quite a lot to be able to, to grow it and harvest it on site. All the bluegrass that's being converted to non-irrigated native, that bluegrass is then being used around the greens um, as we're renovating teas, going to the pool, going to parks, going to other city uh, departments. Um, that's that's great, and I said so you by growing the grass and having this longer time period, it allows you, it allows you to do that, right? Because you're, you're doing it over the course of six years. You, you don't necessarily need to, to have, uh, you know, 18 greens worth of, of sod to, to lay down um, by doing it in, in bits and pieces. It allows you to kind of do that advanced planning that, that allows you to save that money. Yeah. There's a lot of advantages to growing. And if you have the space, uh, if we're talking about other communities that can utilize something, um, having a nursery is an absolute ace in the hole, whether it is you have to use it because of vandalism or Mother Nature decides that she's going to be violent. You always have that opportunity you have to, to repair it quickly, uh, but also gives you, like we're doing, the opportunity over a period of years to convert to these newer types of 
of grass. I always tell people you know, that we're going from a moped to a Lamborghini by switching these turf varieties. They can they use so much less water, so much less fertilizer, so much less fungicides. And if you start looking at those savings, um, even if it has to be a, a 10 year process, it's definitely worthwhile. Um, Jen Jennifer, you alluded to uh, non-golfers using Buffalo Dunes or, or, or wanting to make Buffalo Dunes more attractive to non-golfers and your, and your love for it, even though you're not a golfer. Um, could you talk maybe a little bit about what the, the golf course does to, to be attractive or to attract non-golfers? That's something I think um, more and more municipal golf courses need to do a to do a better job of across the country. So, so I think there's a lot of ways that you can use it as a non-golfer, and really, I feel like the city's been talking about those sorts of things since I first started with them. I remember going on a uh, department head retreat where we walked around on a path that had been created for um, us to kind of start thinking about what a walking or running or cross. Um, country trail might look like at the golf course because um, it's very scenic and it's very peaceful and it's far enough outside of town that there's nothing else around um, and uh, the area the natural area that surrounds Buffalo Dunes is very pretty and so um, I know I've taken family pictures there several times um, and I know a lot of the photographers use it as a as a good spot to um, do their family photos of different of different people. Um, but also I've been out there early in the morning and they have a um, they kind of have like a grandstand area where you can see out over the whole course um, and you can see all the little ponds and and uh, areas where there's sand and grass and and it's just a really nice, peaceful place um, to go and walk around or to go and hang out and visit with people. Um, and it's just very inviting. And I think that um, people go to Buffalo Dunes um, even when they're not playing golf for that reason. Uh, Zach, um, I've seen some of the before and after pictures, um, just really uh, striking um, the improvement. Um, can you just talk a little bit about what you're trying to accomplish architecturally uh, through the through the master plan process? We've talked a lot about um, the, the 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 turf grass switchover and and uh, saving of water, but from an architecture standpoint, for for us golf nerds out there, what what what's what's your thought process and what are you what are you trying to accomplish? Absolutely, um, you know it's very exciting. Like I said, when I first visited Buffalo Dunes, the topography immediately drew me in. Uh, it has tons, tons of potential, and it was just kind of waiting in the in the wings, waiting to be to be unearthed. Um, so, you know, number one, when I'm looking at any golf course, whether it's a new golf course or renovation of a golf course, you're looking at the natural site and the advantages that the natural site has. And like I've talked about before, you know, the sand dunes are the crown jewel uh, of Buffalo Dunes. So we need to really enhance those sand dunes. Um, since the golf course was built in 1976, a number of trees had been planted, you know, not so many, not as many as, as other courses, um, but there were about 400 trees that had been planted. Some of them were cottonwood trees, which have matured beautifully and have really turned into specimen trees. Um, and other ones were, were pine trees, you know, and if you look around, you, you drive south of town, there aren't any trees. It's, it's just the native sand dunes. So part of the process, and Clay has really helped with that. It, it started out kind of slow. People tend to be a little bit hesitant when you talk about removing trees, um, but we've got 115 of those pine trees out and those pine trees are unveiling the native sand dunes. And the native sand dunes are, you know, it's what's at Sand Hills, it's what's at Prairie Dunes, it's what's at Dismal River. They're really the showcase of the golf course. And once that topography shines, you can really see, okay, hey, this, you know, this green site sits a lot higher than it used to. You know, there could be a beautiful blowout bunker that sits right into this dune that you maybe never saw because the trees were there. So, you know, just looking at the natural site is always step one, you know, and from there, you look at the architecture. Um, you know, aesthetically, certainly there are huge improvements in promoting the natural environment, um, but it works well from an architecture standpoint as well. Uh, the irrigation system was relatively new when I started, so that's kind of a constraint and we're working around the irrigation system. 
but within those confines, there's tons of space for creativity, you know, and like Clay mentioned, we're putting new grass on the greens. So we can go out, we go out, strip the old grass, take a look at the contours that are on the green within the confines of the irrigation. And I'm looking at every green and I say, hey, how can I make this more interesting for golf? Where can I make a new pin position? You know, where can we slide a bunker maybe from the right side of the green to the left side of the green to make it more interesting for the golfers and also more playable for the golfers. So in my mind, you know, they're pretty simple changes, um, but when you add up all, you know, four five, six simple changes per hole, all of a sudden you get a really major difference. And even I'm surprised at some of the before and after pictures, you know, I'm there every day on site, you see the changes happen slowly. Um, but when, you know, whether it's pictures that I took or pictures that Clay took, when you put it side by side from 2017 until now, it's a dramatic difference. Yeah, it, it really is. So uh, congrats, on, congrats on that. Um, we're, we're getting towards the end of our time. So I want to encourage anyone who's listening or watching, um, if they've got any questions to please type them in the chat and we'll get to them uh, in a little bit. So um, I guess, you know, what it sounds like Zach, what you've done is, is, is give the golf course more of a sense of place um, so that people understand that they're, they're golfing in the sandhills of Kansas. Um, and that sort of leads me to my next question, which is, um, for Matt, maybe, uh, what does a project like this mean for the community of, of Garden City uh, in Western Kansas? It's significant. Um, the, it, it, and I think Clay projected a lot of this. Um, it, you know, one, the first year will be the hardest because you've got a course that for the 17 years prior that I had been with the city, had never had a temporary green. And so you're throwing out three temporary greens right out of the gate. And so, you know, are we going to weather the, uh, that the first few tree removals were noticed and, and, uh, and, but we knew we had a lot more to go and just, you know, whether the first year from a, uh, from a uh, managing player expectations and those, uh, that standpoint and get them to the point where they can see the, the finished product. After that, it's why do we have to wait six years? Like, let's go, let's go, let's go. So um, incredibly popular in the community are, I, I believe our golf course community is, you know, if not 100%, 98, 99% full, full on behind this project because of some of the other things that everybody else has shared. The community that doesn't play golf is behind the project and what it means. Clay said, you know, we've, we've received a lot of recognition, a lot of awards. There's a lot of pride behind Buffalo Dunes, um, but all the awards and recognition we get are qualified. You know, it's it's best public course under 50 bucks or, or you know, there's a, there's all these like add-ons. Uh, and he, uh, you know, he said, by the time this, this course is done, there won't uh, be any qualifiers. It'll just be, this is a top 100 municipal golf course. And so and, you know, we're halfway through the project and we're already uh, receiving the, that kind of recognition. So um, he was really kind of right on the communities, uh, the communities behind it. It means a lot. It, it, uh, it also means a lot for our organization. I mean, our organization, uh, you know, they bought into Clay's experiment. It serves as uh an example that you can hold out there and say, you know, look, there's, there's freedom to be experimental. There's, there's freedom to, uh, you know, take some chances and build your own legacy uh, within your department. And um, he's, you know, he's certainly that type of leader, but um, it's nice to have a model of that in the organization that uh, others can see and, and, and model, whether they're a police department, a fire department, a zoo, uh, you know, parks and rec. Uh, uh, there's something that everybody has a chance to learn uh, uh, from what Clay's done and what he's done with his partnership with Zach. Um, have you seen, you know, with with these awards and press coverage, have you seen people, you know, coming from further afield to to visit Buffalo Dunes? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. if you follow Clay's Twitter feed, which is maybe one of the more entertaining golf architecture Twitter feeds. So hop on and follow him. Uh, 
yeah, there's people that chime in all the time that uh, are coming just to see what's going on and and they see the changes that they've made. Uh, you know, Zach and Clay treat every one of those holes like, you know, it's it's a child. And, you know, if you have 18 children, you don't have a favorite one, you just love them all. And so when they're working on that, or when they're working um, on a hole, they're all they're all in. So uh, you, you you get that sense when you're around them. You get the sense following them on social media. Uh, they're they're heavily invested in each detail of each hole. And yeah, yeah, it, it's it's capturing attention. We got people traveling to south, little old Southwest Kansas to check out a municipal golf course. Um, well, you know, it's always great when the when the story behind it is as good as the finished product. Um, so, you know, I, I guess we're sort of uh, getting up on time here. Um, you know, are there, are there any, I think we guys have done a great job of, of talking about sort of the takeaways and what other municipalities could emulate um, from this project. But it seems to me sort of the most important would be the, the sort of breaking down of silos across uh, the municipality to make um, the community uh, to make the make that allows the community to work together to uh, create uh, to achieve goals that um, would otherwise be daunting or maybe outside of budgetary realms. Is, you, you believe that's sort of the the big the big message here is is how to work together as a community. Yes, I do. I mean, the <laughs> Zach will tell you the sand hills matter and make a difference. But I, you know, the takeaway for me is the uh, this isn't a this isn't a a money thing. I mean, if if a golf course wants to do it, now they may have to scale it. A golf course wants to do it, uh, you know, you know, having having staff you trust and and you know that isn't just our trust in clay or jennifer's trust in clay back when this started it's really clay's tr trust in his own staff because he'll tell you um you know he's the uh, you know he's the leader of that group but he has to have 100 percent buy-in on that relatively small but talented team where none of this happens yeah clay that's actually one of the questions uh, that we've gotten uh, in the chat is, is how big is your staff um and then we talked. We touched on this, but how much did you take on in-house versus contracting out, and and how did you handle tree removal? Um, it sounds like you you did pretty much everything in-house. Uh, but how big is your staff? And you can talk a little bit about uh, how you went about the project. So I have myself, two assistants, and a mechanic, and uh, we normally during this period normally have two, possibly three part-time individuals. Um, We've had to get creative in, in every level. So because to the extent of we've built our own um, sod roller three point, you know, so now we can transport instead of us having to pick up everything we are, we're using the tractors um, to transport the bluegrass lay it. It's still fairly labor intensive, but it's not near it handling every piece. Um, so as far as the trees go, um, we understand that it's a sensitive subject and we want to acknowledge that with the golfers. Uh, we tend to um, try to do small bar tree removal, you know, we maybe one, one a week, to one every other week. We tend to do them on Mondays um, to the extent of where, you know, just taking the pain points out of listening to a, a chainsaw or seeing a tree limb taken off the golf course. We do that during our Monday mornings when we have um, the golf course to ourselves. So we can try to take away as many pain points as we can. Uh, like Matt said too, it, it was sensitive initially, but now they've seen the vision and they're seeing the sand dunes and it's stirring their souls and they want to see it more. So now it's, hey, let's take two down, you know, every day. And it's, well, our, our staff can't handle that. So um well, you, 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 your staff is doing the tree removal and stump grinding and all that stuff. Yeah. So, so far we have the only contracted work we've had is, uh, Mr. Barty and his mini X, uh, watching him do magic. Uh, we anticipate the final phases to have maybe a few spots where we need irrigation crew. Um, but generally speaking, we're, there's no really contract outside of those. Yeah, and I, 
we talked about it in a little bit before, you know, none of this is possible with just um, our small staff. If we didn't have the other departments buy in and it be part of their vision now, you know, we ask for volunteers um, to help lay a green and there's 30 people that show up. We had firefighters this year laying sod in their full full dress <laughs> um, because they had to be ready in case they made a phone call uh, or if, if they got a call. Uh, it's the nope, no, nope, it took us that. two and a half hours to lay sod. It was incredible. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. And and um, you know we talked about maybe the top line number, but to date you've you've spent about ninety three thousand dollars. Is that yeah, so we're, yeah, 92, 93,000 and 20 of that includes the initial developing of the master plan. So if you remove that, um, so far our phases to do 10 holes, Zach, you can help me out 30 some bunkers, several T's, uh, we're at, uh, $72,000 so far. Yeah. It's, when you, when you, uh, talk about, um, golf course, uh, development or redevelopment or, or master plan stuff and you're getting down to the thousands of dollars rather than the tens of thousands of dollars you know that you're uh you're you're really watching every dollar and being very economical so could, could well, and i, I want to note that you know this isn't it's not it's not doing that to try to save uh, we are trying to save as much money but we're not going to jeopardize the quality of the work we, we just have uh, several advantages that allow us to Sure. maintain the most highest level of of uh, experience but be able to do it in a little bit innovative or a, a little bit of a twist yeah um Koy, i'm glad, glad you brought that up the green complexes that they've renovated are incredible i mean just the uh you know some of them are taking them back to where the uh it would suggest the architecture uh, the original architect imagined the, the the green to be and where it was actually actually built but um you know even in, in that i mean it, they've enlarged these complexes many more playable pens uh it's it's yeah it, it's not a cheap renovation um uh, from a quality of work standpoint it's it's fantastic and uh the nicest greens that i've played yeah it sounds like with your plan, basically of of uh, growing the sod on the greens and laying the sod, um, that that you're doing that you know you're doing that during during the sort of the heart of the season, the laying of the sod and and the shaping of the of the greens. Uh, how did you manage uh, whole, whole closures or 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 lost revenue through through that sort of uh, uh, thing? Um, so we have yet to close down a full hole. We have, as mentioned, as, uh, as mentioned earlier, we we've, we've created temporary greens in front of that site. So, um, a lot of our golf golfers initially, uh, it kind of confused them, but now they're okay. Taking that automatic birdie and going to the next hole. <laughs> uh, it also keeps the golfers engaged in our project because they have to go by the site. Um, as Zach is shaping and, you know, they're always looking in, they stop by, they ask questions. It, it creates a really uh, fun point for us to interact with the golfers and explain what we're doing and um, involve them in the project as well. Um, so we haven't, we haven't seen any lost revenue. Uh, we've had no whole closures uh, so far. Uh, we, we do anticipate one of our phases having a short closure, but other than that, um, there'll be no no disruption to normal play. It's interesting you mentioned the the fact that having the work go on as people are playing it, it sort of uh, engenders buy in from from the community because they see it happening. They they feel like they're part of the process. And when we talk to the the group from Winter Park Nine. You know, that's a very public down in Orlando. Um, it's a very public place, and so as they were, they, they were shut down. But as they were going through the construction, uh, everyone from the community could see exactly what was going on, and it, it did. It, it created buy-in. Uh, so that's a, that's an interesting interesting note for sure. Um, uh, one other question from from uh, the audience: um, uh, the routing remained unchanged, I assume. And then uh, the, the follow-on question is the varieties of grasses that you're you're, I guess, using on the green. You've talked about switching out the the buffalo for the blue and the 
in the out of the play areas. But uh, I guess on the greens is what the question would be. Yeah, so we've we've just switched from an older variety pin cross bent grass to a newer variety, which is dominant extreme bent grass. And I will not talk about that any further because I can see Jennifer is already bored about talking about grass <laughs> types. Uh, one another advantage that we do have um, with this system is uh, like it, we are all cool season. Um, which includes bluegrass. So these areas that we are are taking out for non-irrigated native can be utilized throughout the golf course, whether it be on tees or surrounds or whatnot. You would you would be limited um, if you were in a warm climate where you had warm season, let's say warm season surrounds and fairways and cool season rough, then you would be limited with where you could go with that stuff. But um, another lucky advantage for us is that translates across the golf across the golf course and, and some of that grass though is, is being taken off property to the zoo and the cemetery too is right you're you're it's going all the yeah. way across yeah. yeah so not only uh pool parks rec zoo um some of the tree removal as well we've identified some of the pine trees have very unique characteristics and the zoo has come out and um trim them to their liking and they're actually now the the part of the panther exhibit uh which is which is kind of a fun spin that's one of zach's favorite stories is um the tree removal and it being now part of our local zoo it's great it's great um matt maybe maybe this is a question for you um and we talked a little bit about the attention that uh, this project has gotten and has received for both uh, the way it's gone on, but also the end product. Um, due to the sort of the economic activity that it may be generating, has there been any thought process to reaching out to to larger governments like county or state for for additional funding or or planning? Um, no, I think in large part to uh, what Jennifer pointed out, and uh, you know, Clay is has created the budgetary window for this to happen within kind of the threshold of what has historically been spent out of the uh, the golf course maintenance budget. So, uh, you know, the it, at this point in time, there really isn't a, a motivation to go out and kind of seek funding assistance that might also bring with it at the same time uh, strings that, that uh, would unnecessarily bind or handcuff clay. Yeah. Uh, now, I, you know, I say all that, and I would, I would say, you know, the uh, Finney County CVB does a nice job promoting uh, both golf courses, Southwind Country Club and, and uh, Buffalo Dunes Golf Course is a, a golf destination for the community. So we're not without assistance from other areas, but just not specific to this project yet. Um, I think down the road, the whole master plan in and of itself uh, has a clubhouse renovation uh, or a clubhouse replacement uh, as part of it. And, you know, we'll, whether it's intergovernmental or public-private partnership, um, something like that's going to probably have to come in to make that happen. Got it. Um, well, I, I just want to thank uh, everyone uh, for taking time out of their their busy schedules and, and sharing uh, about uh, Buffalo Dunes and Garden City. Uh, it's an inspirational project. I can't wait to get out there and, and see the the project, whether it's in the next few years or, or uh, after it's all complete, um, it really does sound like a special place. And uh, it's an inspirational story of how a community can work together um, to, to make improvements to a community asset um, and do it in a way that's economical, that works for everybody, that's uh, really uh, an inspiration. So th thank, thank you all for your time and um, look forward to, to seeing you out there in, in Garden City.